The Damned by Algernon Blackwood Chapter 1 I'm over 40, Francis, and rather set in my ways, I said good-naturedly, ready to yield if she insisted that our going together on the visit involved her happiness. My work is rather heavy just now, too, as you know. The question is, can I work there with a lot of unassorted people in the house? Mabel doesn't mention any other people, Bill, was my sister's rejoinder. I gather she's alone, as well as lonely. By the way she looked sideways, out of the window at nothing, it was obvious she was disappointed. But to my surprise, she did not urge the point. And as I glanced at Mrs. Franklin's invitation, lying upon her sloping lap, the neat, childish handwriting conjured up a mental picture of the banker's widow, with her timid, insignificant personality, her pale gray eyes, and her expression as of a backward child. I thought, too, of the roomy country mansion her late husband had altered to suit his particular needs and of my visit to it a few years ago when its barren spaciousness suggested a wing of Kensington Museum fitted up temporarily as a place to eat and sleep in. Comparing it mentally with a pokey Chelsea flat where I and my sister kept in Peck Eunice house, I realized other points as well. Unworthy details flashed across me to entice. The fine library, the organ, the quiet workroom I should have, perfect service, the delicious cup of early tea, and hot baths at any moment of the day, without a geyser. It's a longish visit, a month, isn't it? I hedged, smiling at the details that seduced me and ashamed of my man's selfishness, yet showing that Francis expected it of me. There are points about it, I admit. If you're set on my going with you, I could manage it all right. I spoke at length in this way because my sister made no answer. I saw her tired eyes gazing into the dreariness of Oakley Street and felt a pang strike through me. After a pause, in which again she said no word, I added, So when you write the letter, you might hint, perhaps, that I usually work all the morning, and am not a very lively visitor. Then she'll understand, you see. And I half rose to return to my diminutive study, where I was slaving just then at an absorbing article on comparative aesthetic values in the blind and deaf. But Frances did not move. She kept her gray eyes upon Oakley Street, where the evening mist from the river drew mournful perspectives into view. It was late October. We heard the omnibuses thundering across the bridge. The monotony of that broad, characterless street seemed more than usually depressing. Even in June sunshine, it was dead. But with autumn, its melancholy soaked into every house between King's Road and the Embankment. It washed thought into the past, instead of inviting it hopefully towards the future. For me, its easy width was an avenue through which nameless slums across the river sent creeping messages of depression, and I always regarded it as winter's main entrance into London. Fog, slush, gloom trooped down it every November, waving their forbidding banners till March came to rout them. Its one claim upon my love was that the south wind swept sometimes unobstructed up it, soft with suggestions of the sea. These lugubrious thoughts I naturally kept to myself, though I never ceased to regret the little flat whose cheapness had seduced us. Now, as I watched my sister's impassive face, I realized that perhaps she, too, 
felt as I felt, yet brave woman, without betraying it. And look here, Fanny, I said, putting a hand upon her shoulder as I crossed the room. It would be the very thing for you. You are worn out with catering and housekeeping. Mabel is your oldest friend besides, and you've hardly seen her since he died. She's been abroad for a year, Bill, and only just came back, my sister interposed. She came back rather unexpectedly, though I never thought she would go there to live. She stopped abruptly. Clearly, she was only speaking half her mind. Probably, she went on, Mabel wants to pick up old links again. Naturally, I put in, yourself chief among them, the veiled reference to the house I let pass. It involved discussing the dead man for one thing. I feel I ought to go anyhow, she resumed, and of course it would be jollier if you came too. You'd get in such a muddle here by yourself and eat wrong things and forget to air the rooms and, oh, everything. She looked up laughing. Only, she added, there's the British Museum. But there's a big library there, I answered, and all the books of reference I could possibly want. It was of you, I was thinking. You could take up your painting again. You always sell half of what you paint. It would be a splendid reset, too. And Sussex is a jolly country to walk in. By all means, Fanny, I advise. Our eyes met as I stammered in my attempts to avoid expressing the thought that hid in both of our minds. My sister had a weakness for dabbling in the various new theories of the day, and Mabel, who before her marriage had belonged to foolish societies for investigating the future life to the neglect of the present one, had fostered this undesirable tendency. Her amiable, impressionable temperament was open to every psychic wind that blew. I deplored, detested the whole business. But even more than this, I abhorred the later influence that Mr. Franklin had steeped his wife in, capturing her body and soul in his somber doctrines. I had dreaded lest my sister also might be caught. Now that she is alone again, I stop short. Our eyes now made pretense impossible for the truth had slipped out inevitably, stupidly, although unexpressed in definite language. We laughed, turning our faces a moment to look at other things in the room. Frances picked up a book and examined its cover as though she had made an important discovery. While I took my case out and lit a cigarette, I did not want to smoke. We left the matter there. I went out of the room before further explanation could cause tension. Disagreements grow into discord from such tiny things, wrong adjectives, or a chance inflection of the voice. Frances had a right to her views of life as much as I had. At least, I reflected comfortably. We had separated upon an agreement this time, recognized mutually, though not actually stated. In this point of meaning was, oddly enough, our way of regarding someone who was dead. For we had both disliked the husband with a great dislike, and during his three years married life had only been to the house once for a weekend visit, arriving late on Saturday. We had left after an early breakfast on Monday morning, ascribing my sister's dislike to a natural jealousy at losing her old friend. I said merely that he displeased me, yet we both knew that the real emotion lay deeper. Frances, loyal, honorable creature, had kept silence, and beyond saying that house and grounds, he altered one and laid out the other, distressed her as an expression of his personality somehow. Distressed was the word she used. No further explanation had passed her lips. Our dislike of his personality was easily accounted for, up to a point, since both of us shared the artist's point of view, that a creed, cut to measure and carefully dried, was an ugly thing, and that a dogma to which believers must subscribe or perish everlastingly 
was a barbarism resting upon cruelty. But while my own dislike was purely due to an abstract worship of beauty, my sister's had another twist in it. For with her new tendencies, she believed that all religions were an aspect of truth, and that no one, even the lowest wretch, could escape heaven in the long run. Samuel Franklin, the rich banker, was a man universally respected and admired. In the marriage, though Mabel was fifteen years his junior, won general applause. His bride was an heiress in her own right. Breweries and the story of her conversion at a revivalist meeting where Samuel Franklin had spoken fervently of heaven and terrifyingly of sin, hell, and damnation, even contained a touch of genuine romance. She was a brand snatched from the burning. His detailed eloquence had frightened her into heaven. Salvation came in the nick of time. His words had plucked her from the edge of that lake of fire and brimstone, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. She regarded him as a hero, sighed her relief upon his saintly shoulder, and accepted the peace he offered her with grateful resignation. For her husband was a religious man who successfully combined great riches with the glamour of winning souls. He was a portly figure, though tall, with masterful big hands, his fingers rather thick and red, and his dignity that just escaped being pompous held in it something that was implacable. A convinced assurance, almost remorseless, gleamed in his eyes when he preached especially, and his threats of hellfire must have scared souls stronger than the timid, receptive Mabel whom he married. He clad himself in long frock coats, hat buttoned unevenly, big square boots and trousers that invariably bagged at the knee and were a little short. He wore low collars, spats occasionally, and a tall black hat that was not of silk. His voice was alternately hard and unctuous, and he regarded theaters, ballrooms, and race courses as a vestibule of that brimstone lake of whose geography he was as positive as of his great banking offices in the city. A philanthropist up to the hilt, however, no one ever doubted his complete sincerity. His convictions were ingrained. His faith, borne out by his life, as witness his name upon so many admirable societies, as treasurer, patron, or heading the donation list. He bulked large in the world of doing good, a broad and stately stone in the rampart against evil, and his heart was genuinely kind and soft for others who believed as he did. Yet, in spite of his true sympathy with suffering and his desire to help, he was narrow as a telegraph wire and unbending as a church pillar. He was intensely selfish, intolerant as an officer of the Inquisition. His bourgeois soul constructed a revolting scheme of heaven that was reproduced in miniature in all he did and planned. Faith was the sign qua non of salvation, and by faith he meant belief in his own particular view of things, which faith, except every one do keep whole and undefiled, Without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. All the world but his own small, exclusive sect must be damned eternally. A pity, but alas, inevitable. He was right. Yet he prayed without ceasing, and gave heavily to the poor, the only thing he could not give, being big ideas to his provincial and suburban deity. Pettier than an insect, and more obstinate than a mule, he had also the superior, sleek humility of the Chosen One. He was church warden, too. He read the lesson in a place of worship, either chilly or overheated, where neither organ, vestments, nor lighted candles were permitted, but where the odor of hair wash on the boys' heads in the back rows pervaded the entire building. This portrait of the banker who accumulated riches both on earth and in heaven, 
may possibly be overdrawn. However, because Francis and I were artistic temperaments, that viewed the type with a dislike and distrust amounting to contempt. The majority considered Samuel Franklin a worthy man and a good citizen. The majority, doubtless, held the saner view. A few years more, and he certainly would have been made a baronet. He relieved much suffering in the world, as assuredly as he caused many souls the agonies of torturing fear by his emphasis upon damnation. Had there been one point of beauty in him, we might have been more lenient, only we found it not, and I admit, took little pains to search. I shall never forget the look of our dour forgiveness with which he heard our excuses for missing morning prayers that Sunday morning of our single visit to the towers. My sister learned that a change was made soon afterwards, prayers being conducted after breakfast instead of before. The towers stood solemnly upon a Sussex hill amid park-like modern grounds, but the house cannot better be described. It would be so wearisome for one thing than by saying that it was a cross between an overgrown, pretentious Norwood villa and one of those Saturnine institutes for cripples the train passes as it slinks, ashamed through South London and to Surrey. It was wealthily furnished, and at first sight imposing, but on closer acquaintance revealed a meager personality, barren and austere. One looked for rules and regulations on the walls, all signed by order. The place was a prison that shut out the world. There was, of course, no billiard room, no smoking room, no room for play of any kind, and the great hall at the back, once a chapel, which might have been used for dancing, theatricals, or other innocent amusements, was consecrated in his day to meetings of various kinds, chiefly brigades, temperance, or missionary societies. There was a harmonium at one end on the level floor, a raised dais or platform at the other, and a gallery above for the servants, gardeners, and coachmen. It was heated with hot water pipes and hung with doors pitchers, though these latter were soon removed and stored out of sight in the attics as being too unspiritual. In polished, shiny wood, it was a representation in miniature of that pokey, exclusive heaven he took about with him, externalizing it in all he did and planned, even in the grounds about the house. Changes in the towers, Francis told me, had been made during Mabel's year of widowhood abroad. An organ put into the big hall, the library made livable and recatalogued, when it was permissible to suppose she had found her soul again and returned to her normal, healthy views of life, which included enjoyment in play, literature, music, and the arts, without, however, a touch of that trivial thoughtlessness usually termed worldliness. Miss Franklin, as I remembered her, was a quiet little woman, shallow, perhaps, and easily influenced, but sincere as a dog and thorough in her faithful friendship. Her tastes at heart were Catholic, and that heart was simple and unimaginative. That she took up with the various movements of the day was sign merely that she was searching in her limited way for a belief that should bring her peace. She was, in fact, a very ordinary woman, her caliber a little less than that of Francis. I knew they used to discuss all kinds of theories together, but as these discussions never resulted in action, I had come to regard her as harmless. Still, I was not sorry when she married, and I did not welcome now a renewal of the former intimacy. The philanthropist she had given no children, or she would have made a good and sensible mother. No doubt she would marry again. Mabel mentions that she's been alone at the Towers since the end of August, Francis told me at tea time, and I'm sure she feels out of it and lonely. 
It would be a kindness to go. Besides, I always liked her. I agreed. I had recovered from my attack of selfishness. I expressed my pleasure. You've written to accept, I said, half statement and half question. Frances nodded. I thanked for you, she added quietly, explaining that you were not free at the moment, but that later, if not inconvenient, you might come down for a bit and join me. I stared. Frances sometimes had this independent way of deciding things. I was convicted and punished into the bargain. Of course, there followed argument and explanation, as between brother and sister who were affectionate, but the recording of our talk could be of little interest. It was arranged thus, Frances and I both satisfied. Two days later, she departed for the towers, leaving me alone in the flat with everything planned for my comfort and good behavior. She was rather a tyrant in her quiet way, and her last words as I saw her from Charing Cross rang in my head for a long time after she was gone. I'll write and let you know, Bill. Eat properly, mind, and let me know if anything goes wrong. She waved her small gloved hand, nodded her head, till the feather brushed the window and was gone.